It's never enough to remind people every single day how many workers are out there on the front lines risking their lives in the pandemic. I've talked about those folks regularly on the show, transit workers, retail workers, teachers, and surely the workers who put food on our plates are right up there high on the list. The folks, for example, who put chicken on our plates, they're crammed together in poultry processing plants, and they're getting sick by the thousands and dying by the hundreds, along with people who are processing meat for our consumption as well. So today we are going to check in again on the killing fields in the poultry plants. And I'm also going to have a chat with a Democratic candidate who's trying to win a fairly Republican district in Florida. This is Jonathan Tassini, and it's great to have you on our show for August 26th, 2020. Our major sponsor, as I always remind people, is the American Postal Workers Union, which fights for its 200,000 members and retirees, as well as 2,000 private sector mail workers. You can help us promote this show in two ways. One, you can go and sign up to the show at our YouTube channel. That helps us promote our show in the video world, even if you're continuing to listen to it as an audio podcast. So go over to YouTube and look for The Working Life Show with Jonathan Tassini and subscribe. And of course, the second way you can help us is become a sponsor of the show. You can do that in two ways. You go over to our website, workinglife.org, click on the podcast tab, and then find your way over to Patreon. And there you can become a sponsor either on a one-time basis or on a monthly basis. And you can also do that through Act Blue because we partnered up with Act Blue. So you can become a sponsor either on a one-time basis or a monthly basis at Act Blue. Before my guests join us, I want to recount an experience I had which drives home the immorality of the economic system that we must all work hard to overthrow. Last week, I was driving about town doing a few errands, while of course always wearing my mask, when I passed by a bank. There were hundreds of people lined up at the bank with pieces of paper in their hands, and a ton of them were just crowded together, no social distancing. They were pressed against each other at the door of the bank. I drove down another block and circled back to the spot. I knew what this was instantly. When Republicans blocked extending enhanced federal unemployment benefits to millions of people at the end of July, that cut off a stream of money that was going to people to just pay some basic bills, not put them in some luxurious financial state, as Mitch McConnell and a bunch of the other rich senators outrageously were saying on the Senate floor. On top of that, thousands of people in Oregon had not received a dime in benefits because the unemployment system basically collapsed swamped by the huge tidal wave of claims that surged into the system when the economy crashed. And this is a problem, by the way, that other states have experienced as well, because we have a shitty, inadequate unemployment system on a good day. So what the Oregon legislature did was create a pot of money to give out to people one-time grants of $500 for folks making less than $48,000 a year, but the overall pot was limited, and so it won't reach every single person. And on top of that, to get the money, a person had to go to a bank or a credit union. And that's where this crowd comes in. A sign of panic and fear, really. The kind of images that maybe we associate coming from countries around the world when a massive financial crisis sends people scrambling to banks in fear that their money is lost. By the way, in fact, I'm also a member of a neighborhood emergency team, and we got an immediate alert asking folks with cars to go to an emergency center to pick up masks to deliver to banks because so many people who are desperately trying to get this money did not have masks, and banks would not let people come inside the bank to file their paperwork if they were not wearing masks. Now, that is just one image of thousands that we've witnessed today. And these are all signs of an immoral society, a place where millions of people can't pay their bills because of a public health crisis created by leaders who don't give a damn and now exacerbated by leaders who don't care whether people are going hungry. Absolute immorality. And a solid reason for people to rise up and overthrow this corrupt economic system. Now, folks are not just emptying their bank accounts because of an immoral system. They're also getting sick 
and dying just doing their jobs. Since the pandemic erupted, I've been covering regularly how workers in many jobs are getting sick and dying because they are forced to go to work. Forced mainly because millions of people don't make enough money to build up an emergency cushion. So sick or not, they need the paycheck. And we don't have, like many civilized countries, paid sick leave. So it puts even more pressure on an ill worker to show up and unfortunately then infect other co-workers. And making matters worse, employers really haven't given a damn about creating safe working conditions during this pandemic because, after all, it's all about making profits, not human life. Now, the only time when working conditions have improved is when workers challenge the dangerous conditions that they were being put in. The poultry industry is one of the worst examples of the carnage workers are going through. Now, I've written about and looked at the poultry industry for a very long time because it is a cesspool of greedy corporations exploiting people in some of the worst working conditions you can find. And that's on a quote unquote good day. Cramped spaces, bad air, bacteria everywhere, and just an epidemic of injuries. Some of them lifelong carpal tunnel injuries and other afflictions. COVID-19 has simply exploited the chain of horrors that really has existed for decades in this industry. Just consider this. Low pay in this industry means workers have to be crowded into terrible housing conditions. They don't have enough money to pay for decent food, and they have very poor health care because they can't afford to go to a doctor. All of which are perfect conditions for a virus to latch onto, infect people, spread to a community, and become almost unstoppable. The virus simply takes advantage of what greed has sowed for decades. So to update us on what poultry workers are facing, let me bring in Alexander Gallimberti. Alexander is the Senior Advocacy and Collaborations Advisor for the U.S. Domestic Program at Oxfam America. And I always think when we talk about the poultry industry that we have to telescope back a little bit, Alex, to give some context. Because to me, we're really dealing with three viruses combined. One is the virus of greed. One is the virus, if I can say, of capitalism. And then one is the coronavirus. And they've all Mm -hmm. sort of melded together here to create this horrendous situation, which I've covered on this show several times since the pandemic began. As you well know... On a good day, meaning absent the coronavirus, the poultry industry was a horrible place to work, right? Yes, correct. So um, that's precisely, I think, the genesis of the crisis that we're dealing with, with what poultry workers are experiencing, with what Oxfam has documented together with our partner organizations, that um, we're, we're dealing with a situation that was already very bad to begin with. Uh, poultry workers, uh, poultry processing plants were already a really terrible place to work at because of the oppressive conditions. And I agree with you on the driving factors for that of greed. Uh, We saw this week on the report published by ProPublica that the poultry industry knew for years that they were vulnerable for a pandemic. Uh, They knew that Um, the workplace had to be adapted. There needed to be preventative measures to make sure that workers could be protected. So Oxfam, our partner organizations, our allies have been saying for years that these workplaces are dangerous. Workers don't have a voice. Uh, Management practices are exploitative. Um, Workers are getting hurt. Workers are being mistreated. Mm -hmm. And when this pandemic began, we tried to tell the industry right on the spot that they need to do something, that this pandemic is gonna hit them hard. And they didn't do anything. They didn't listen. So they try to continue operating business as usual. And, and that I think is the big problem there. And so let's in fact underscore business as usual. You've got 
these companies who are incredibly greedy and incredibly profitable. They're run by CEOs with basically a hard-ass attitude where unions are very weak, where these companies try to bust unions and keep unions out. You've got, on, as I said, on a good day, these workplaces that are crammed together. You've got this intense uh, intensity on the line of a huge number of these chickens in this case, and this is true in meat processing too, whizzing by where workers were crammed together. And as you well know, and I've covered this for a number of years, huge number of injuries, largely because of carpal tunnel syndrome and the the ways in which workers have to make so many cuts in such a short amount of time that they end up with these disfiguring injuries and injuries, lifelong injuries that follow them for decades, even after they've retired. Yeah, exactly. And and this is really um, business as usual for this industry means exactly what they have been doing for decades, mm. which is to try to exploit the cheapest form of labor possible that they can find and really deny the humanity of mm. the people that are in the processing lines, ensuring that we have the readily available supply of chicken that we have. Mm. So if this is the way that the industry has been operating for decades, it is no surprise that when this pandemic hit our economy, they didn't bother to take stock of what needed to be done to protect their workforce, hmm. what needed to be done to protect the humanity, not only of the workers that show up day after day to process the chicken that they sell, but also the communities where they operate. Hmm. Because when these outbreaks started happening and workers that work these processing lines uh, were uh, infected, this had a ripple effect in the entire community. These are communities where the processing plants that are in these small towns are oftentimes the largest employer in town. So if you see the largest employer having a large outbreak, this means that the whole community is impacted. Mm. And I should have added one other factor that's quite important. You mentioned this in your important report, that the communities and especially the workers are largely people of color, largely uh, immigrants and people with undocumented folks. And so they feel most vulnerable to the situation you just described. It's the best job they can get. And they're afraid to speak up because obviously of the consequences of standing up, even though they see around them. And now we're going to move to what's happening in this pandemic. They see around them their co-workers and family members getting sick and dying. Yes. And and, and that is... Um also um the the the, the long standing climate of fear that that lives in this industry i think that the way and 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 you have written, been reporting on this and, and so many outlets have reported historically on this industry how the poultry industry as it industrialized as it became concentrated vertically integrated into having a, a handful of companies controlling the the uh, almost the entire industry um it has been by design that vulnerable populations have been the workforce and it has been a historic transition um, a few decades ago the majority of the workforce was african-american in the pl processing plants in the deep south and by design this has been documented the, the plants in mississippi for instance intentionally switched their workforce from african-american the predominant workforce population in that state to bring latino immigrants to that state because the african-american population started wanting to unionize and organize mm -hmm. so trying to always explore the most vulnerable uh, populations in our workforce is something that is a, a recurrency in this industry. And we see that that's why um, in the, the pandemic and the scenario that we're in right now, um, the vulnerabilities of these workers make it harder for them to push back and say, we are not going to show up because we don't feel safe. And they feel forced to work because oftentimes some of these workers are undocumented. And if they do not show up to work, they are not gonna get a stimulus check. They're mm -hmm. not gonna get unemployment. So it's risk themselves to COVID or face hunger. That's a fabulous point you made before, by the way, uh, the transition in the workforce from African-American workers who began to have the sense that they should have a union to Latino workers 
who are more vulnerable and feel unsure. So that's a fabulous point. So let's actually now dig into the specifics. Let's mm-hmm. talk about the specific things that you have found. And I've talked about this with the RWDSU unions before and folks yeah. that have advocated on behalf of poultry workers. But let's dig into what are the specific things that are happening inside poultry plants that are specific to the poultry industry that are making folks sick and actually many hundreds have died over, you know, nationwide in those poultry pants. And I think my audience has probably read in the general mainstream uh, media about these shutdowns of poultry plants that have happened because of the huge spreads of the disease. So let's talk specifically about those factors. Yes, and I think this goes all to the, the, the biggest problem, which is while the majority of the economy had to take stock, had to stop production or the de- descale production slow down so that we could do the proper prevention the poultry processing industry did not so mm. business and as usual meant that workers were showing up to work and continue to be in very crowded spaces working shoulder to shoulder where it's impossible to have uh, uh physical distancing no worker in the processing line was uh, having the, the luxury of have a six foot distance from their co-workers. They were working shoulder to shoulder on the line, across from other workers on the other side of the line. Um, the break rooms are crowded because they have to stop the line and all of the workers have lunch at the same time. Some plants uh, claimed to have started to stagger breaks, but still in a workplace where you have 1,000, 1,500 workers and they're staggering breaks, you're still having hundreds of workers at the same time in a small break room, mm. uh, bathrooms. Bathroom breaks are also timed. So people have to wait in line, especially women. Women. This is a huge issue for, for gender justice in this, in this workforce. Women workers, they um, have to wait in line. Uh, oftentimes there's not enough facilities in these, in these processing plants. So they have to be crowded, waiting their turn to use a stall and um, the, the entry, um, the sharing of equipment, tools, uh, protective equipment that is offered to them is insufficient. Uh, we heard stories of immigrant workers in North Carolina that asked early on in the pandemic to get face masks, to get face shields, to get protection because they knew that this pandemic was a threat and their uh, community was at risk and employers denied that. And so- that's what's really problematic. So one of the things you said was that people are working shoulder to shoulder. And sometimes I think we use that as kind of a cliche, but it literally is true when you say shoulder to shoulder. And I'm kind of motioning here. People are crammed together so closely that they're banging against each other because from the standpoint of the poultry industry, they want to cram as many workers as possible into a small space in order to keep uh, pace with the whizzing fast production line that's basically speeding those carcasses, the chicken carcasses, and they have to be, many cuts have to be made in a short amount of time. So from their point of view, the most efficient, and I say that in a sarcastic way, the most Mm -hmm. efficient way to run that line is basically cram people together. Precisely. And that is something that has not been changed. The only change that poultry companies offered was to put a plastic curtain in between these workers. So these workers now, instead of having their shoulders touch each other, there's a plastic barrier between them, but the proximity is still there. And health and safety experts have said that this is not, this, this is not a sufficient prevention because the air is still going to go around that one foot bar- plastic barrier, and they're still going to be breathing the same air. And uh, air circulation in these plants is not, uh, is also an issue. Um, that they, these workers are working uh, shoulder to shoulder in stagnant air. And we know that they're working so close together that in previous reports, uh, pre-pandemic that Oxfam published, we documented that um, not only some of the frequent injuries they have, of course, the most frequent is carpal tunnel from the repetitive motion, but also they're standing so close together that it is not uncommon for a worker to accidentally uh, cut a coworker that is standing so close to them while mm-hmm. they're making repetitive motions to slice Incredible. the chicken. And um, when you mentioned ventilation and it's stagnant air, 
I mean, the reason there's stagnant air is because it costs money to actually have good ventilation in these kinds of factories, these locations. And these companies are penny pinchers. They're really abusive. They don't want to spend the money that, again, in a good day, folks should have good ventilation because that makes them, keeps them healthier somewhat. Remember, there's a lot of uh, germs and bacteria that floats around from these chickens and these carcasses on, again, on a good day, even before the pandemic mm -hmm. and people get sick from that. So they don't care about that ventilation. Now, one of the things in the report that I think is also important to underscore is the company is essentially putting pressure on people to come to work, even when they know that they're sick. And they're doing that some ways through these bonuses that they're handing out. They're saying, hey, if you continue to come to work, we're going to give you 500 bucks. If you yeah. continue to show up, we're going to reward you. And that's uh, this very subtle way in which they're exacerbating the situation. Yes. So there are two different ways that we have documented uh, and heard from workers through our partners that the uh, workers are being pressured to go to work and put themselves at risk. And the first one that you just mentioned is the indirect pressure, which is corporately sanctioned through the policies that these corporations have put in place as temporary incentives uh, for, for showing up to work which are attendance-based bonuses. Some companies have announced bonuses that if you show up uh, with perfect attendance for a month, a quarter, a certain period of time, you get a cash bonus for that period. The $500, that's a quarterly bonus, uh, for example. Some of the plants gave an hourly bonus. You get a, a $1 or $2 an hour raise, but you only get that bonus on your hourly paycheck if you had perfect attendance for that pay cycle. So if you show up um, four days uh, uh, for your entire shift, and then on one day in the week, you showed up late or you had to leave early because of a family emergency, then you lose your bonus for the entire mm -hmm. week. So those are incentives for people to show up to work whether or not they're feeling well. So if a worker is on the line and they're starting to feel symptoms, they're starting to feel like they have a headache or they're developing a fever, they are gonna do everything they can to not be noticed, to not tell the managers that they're experiencing symptoms because if they are sent home, they lose their bonus. And um, let's be now, clear, for those folks, the reason they stay at work is partly they don't have paid sick leave, and that's true not yeah. just in this terrible industry, but throughout the country. And specific to this industry, the wages are so low as it is that to miss work for folks that have no other options, as you point out, sometimes this is the only employer in town, that's very frightening because the only other option you will have is either unemployment or maybe working at the 7-Eleven. Correct. And, and also we have to take into account the uh, the – families that uh, a lot of these workers belong to. Um, uh, many of the processing line workers that we interview are women, immigrant women, and in their households, they might have a spouse that lost, lost his income because of the pandemic. Uh, immigrant men that are working in construction, in other jobs in the service industry, and right now, because of the shutdowns, they have lost work. So uh, the poultry processing worker in a household now have, might have become uh, all of a sudden the sole income for an entire family. Mm, so mm. the pressure for them to do everything possible to not lose that income becomes much more elevated. Um, and now the, the one other point that I, that, that I was going to make about things that we heard from our partners, which is a more egregious way to uh, incentivize or force workers to come to work um, when they might have been exposed or they're afraid of exposure to the virus is, uh, and, th and these of course are not corporate sanctioned policies, but we have documented instances where plant supervisors and plant managers are doing this. When a worker is exposed and is told to quarantine and they are told to take a test, um, they get a test that comes negative, but medical experts say that even if you got a test that, they, that, that was negative, you still should quarantine for two weeks before you show up to a crowded space like a poultry plant. But the plant starts calling the worker and say, can you come? You got a yeah. negative test. We need you on the line. Yeah. Or workers that test the positive, and as soon as they stop experiencing symptoms, they're told to go back to the workplace. And that is an egregious way to make workers uh, come back to the workplace and put themselves and their coworkers at risk. 
Okay, and in the last minute or so that we have here, and I want you to do this in a tight fashion, um, I want to point out that poultry workers are essential workers, and it is Mm -hmm. a great thing when people are celebrating, obviously, the healthcare workers, the nurses, the doctors, the people who are treating people who are ill, who come into the hospitals. But let's face it, there are essential workers on the front lines in retail stores, on transit systems, and certainly poultry workers, if everybody thinks for a moment, all the chicken they eat. Let's face it, without those folks putting their lives on the line, you don't yeah. have your chicken in front of you to eat. Now, that may really be an argument for being a vegetarian, which I am, but that's a separate question. Mm-hmm. Um, what I want you to do is, in a few points, say, what's the solution? How do we change those workplaces to, at this point in this pandemic, make people more safe? Yes. Um, So one thing that Oxfam really strives to do is to make sure that these workers are not invisible, because that's the big distinction between essential workers that are um, healthcare workers, first responders, even retail workers, um, comparing these types of essential workers with poultry processing workers, farm workers, food processing workers. They are the invisible essential Mm. workforce. They have always been essential. Food processing workers have been essential way before a a pandemic. They have always been essential, but they have also always been invisible. So at Oxfam, we want to make sure that the consumer public, the general public, understands the realities that they experience. And this is only possible, and I want to take a moment here to really shout out our partners that make this possible, the organizers that work in the ground and make it possible that we can listen to these workers and document their stories, organizers in North Carolina, in Mm -hmm. Texas, in the Delmarva Peninsula that that uh, meet with workers and documented uh, what they do. And I want to name three organiza- uh, a few organizations, if, if, if you allow me. Uh, so the, the Western North Carolina Workers Center, they, they, they collaborate with us for many years. Uh, Centro de Derechos Laborales, an organization in Bryan, Texas. Um, Rebirth Inc., uh, a community Haitian organization in the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, CATA, uh, the Farm Workers Support Committee that also operates in the Delmarva Peninsula and Interfaith Worker Justice have been instrumental. Uh, mm-hmm. So visibilizing these workers is the first thing. The second point is that the consumer public, especially the ones of us that choose to eat meat and, and because of cultural reasons, heritage reasons, or just personal choices, we need to understand that we need to value the product and understand the value of the, of the people that are producing this, especially in a moment of a national crisis of a pandemic like this. I think the general public needs to be aware that we can't expect to buy chicken or other food products at the same price that we used to before. The, the, the real cost of the food that we eat needs to be taken into account, especially the human cost. And workers need to be well remunerated and ensure that they are kept safe in the workplace and consumers need to pay that and also corporations. Well, we will keep after this story, Alex, and uh, I appreciate your work, Oxfam's work generally. And please come back to the show and let us know how this effort to protect poultry workers is going. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for your continuing reporting on this and continuously inviting Oxford to be on your show. The Florida 3rd Congressional District might have been a relatively obscure seat in the mix of 435 congressional districts, except it's held by Ted Yoho, the Yahoo, who called Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a quote-unquote fucking bitch, leading to a spectacular takedown of Yoho and misogyny generally by Ocasio-Cortez on the House floor. Look for it on the internet. It's gone viral and it is epic. Thankfully for the country, Yoho is not running for re-election. It's always good to get rid of the worst of the worst. But still, the district is considered a pretty safe Republican district with an R plus nine lean to it. Trump, in fact, beat Hillary Clinton 56 to 40 in this district in 2016, It's almost 80% white, and it's in the northern part of the state, which tends to have a much more conservative bent. But that said, it may be one of those districts where one can test a populist message, trying to talk to voters about ideas that touch them across the political spectrum. At least that's the theory that Adam Christensen has as he is running to capture that seat. He just actually won the Democratic nomination in a squeaker, And his website might give a little hint to his messaging. For the many, not just me, 
Com. Ring a bell? He joins me now. Well, Adam, the first thing that jumped out at me when I was looking at your background is not just that you have a degree in biology, but you're a three-sport athlete. And I know that isn't necessarily something you're running on, but, you know, my audience likes to hear kind of the personal part of these candidates. So where were, what did you do? What were your sports? Yeah, so biggest mistake of my entire life was <laughs> uh, running cross-country in college, my freshman year of, of college, because they had me running about 70 miles a week. Whoa. It was awful. <laughs> it's the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. Um, I ran cross country. I ran track in college, uh, your scholarship, and then I played soccer uh, for three years as well. I transferred three times. I had seven head coaches in six semesters of college, and uh, I had a lot of fun and uh, got to see a lot of the United States and got to see a lot of different stuff. So I was, I was, it was, it was incredible. I, uh, most of the coaches I had were awful. But at the same time, you know, I had a couple of really good ones and I'm still in touch with them. So I'm very glad that I uh, was able to do that and was able to actually, you know, have some fun in college other than just studying. And I suppose that uh, that commitment to athleticism and being fit probably follows you to a, now to adulthood beyond college. Mm -hmm. Most people do that. But the main point I want to ask is how do you manage to fit that in when you're campaigning relentlessly? Uh, around the clock, especially in the closing times of, a, of an election close to a primary, which you won, which we'll talk about in a second, and then obviously leading up to a general election. It's, it's part of the way in which candidates' lives change that I think most people don't understand. Well, um, <laughs> as soon as college ended, I stopped doing everything. Yeah. I actually stopped running, and I lost 15 pounds. Makes no sense whatsoever. But that's what happened. Um, I actually, you know, I coach, I coach college and high school soccer now. And I've done that for a couple of years ever since I actually stopped playing. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of fun doing that. And honestly, I, I think I enjoy that a lot more than actually going out and doing the running and doing all of the actual things that you're supposed to do. Uh, so currently, no, I, I, uh, I do not have time, unfortunately. Um, the time I do have is spent making sure that the dog is actually taking on a walk and not mad at me all day. <laughs> so that's, it takes up pretty much your entire life. Um, mm. You know, I've still got my, my actual day job. And so I'm able to do that a little bit, but most of basically everything we've been focused on for almost seven months has almost been strictly the campaign. I mean, it's kind of like a startup business. That's all you can think about when you wake up in the morning. It's all you think about when you go to bed at night and then you wake up the next morning, you do it again. So you transformed over time from a Republican to a Democrat. What, was that about the biggest thing for me i think was just I, I i mean i grew up in the church i grew up in indiana i grew up in just a, like very conservative area um i ran a polling place at the age of 18 uh for obama's presidents so I, like the uh, the election obama versus uh, i think it was romney and i only had two people in my entire polling location vote for barack obama and those two people were required by law to be at the precinct so the precinct could be open. And so like that is where I grew up in. And really the biggest things that really changed me, I grew up believing that we were supposed to take care of the poor and the hungry and the sick and actually like focus on people and, and believe in people. I grew up believing that neither party cared whether or not I was going to live or die or, or cared about me whatsoever. And what I started to realize, especially as I got older, is that the people that had raised me and the people that I knew and had taught me the things that I grew up with, they were not actually following them through when it came to politics. They'd go to church, they would say all these great things, and then when it came to politics, they would do the exact opposite. And what I realized was I couldn't keep doing that. That if I was actually going to be the person that I was raised to be, I had to actually start focusing on making sure that the people whose lives were supposed to be better were actually focusing on. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the biggest transition was that and, and realizing that the people that I was growing up with, when I came to Fox, they just they were not fulfilling what they were saying. And I'm one of those people where if somebody says something and doesn't actually do it, I don't like that. I was taught that actions speak louder than words. And the Democratic Party is the only party that actually explicitly says it cares or is supposed to care about people. And so, so just to know. underscore that point, uh, I'm not a believer, I'm an atheist, but you mentioned that you came out of a tradition of church-going folks and going to church. So I assume what you were referring to 
is this notion on the part of Jesus and others about caring for your neighbor and caring for the poor and that kind of philosophy, which we see Republicans and frankly, too many Democrats aren't looking out for people who aren't rich and aren't the elite. And there's too much focus on on corporate elites and the wealthy. And we've got this free market system that advantages the wealthy. So you saw something askew with that. Well, I mean, I was always taught that the greatest radical, I mean, not just Jesus, I mean, the greatest radicals of all time, they did not focus or spend their time with the elite. They did not spend their time with religious leaders. They did not spend their time with the, the, the political leaders of the day. They didn't do that. They spent their time with the people that nobody else would give time for, the people that were cast out of society, the people that nobody focused on and nobody cared about. Mm -hmm. And they were able to start movements with those people that changed everything around them. And the thing is that I realized is that if, if you don't have a movement of people, nothing will ever change because we can talk about changing structures. We can talk about making sure that people are focused on, but if you don't force it to happen, if you don't build that political power, it's never going to. And so exactly what you're saying, the corporate wings of both parties, that's what we're fighting against. We're fighting because for the last 40 years, we've been forgotten. We've been not, not forgotten. They know exactly who we are. They don't care. They care about themselves and they care about the people that give them money. And that's it. And let's focus on that for a moment. I'm glad you mentioned that because this has been one of my uh, big issues. And one of the reasons that I've been a big supporter of Bernie Sanders for a very long time is that there are essentially two corporate wings uh, in the parties. The Democratic Party has its corporate wing and its corporate donors who basically have dictated both trade policy, economic policy, and foreign policy. And obviously, the Republican Party is dominated by corporate interests. So very much about your district, which is, in theory, and I check this out, considered to be a safe or solid Republican district. Does that resonate with the people that you're presumably going to be talking about to the general election? Meaning, do you have you sensed, across the political spectrum, a disgust with the control that corporations have over both parties. And is that part of your messaging? Oh, yeah. I mean, people are pissed. That's the best way I can put it. Republicans, independents, and Democrats, it does not matter who you are. They are mad. And they are mad because they have been told, they were told in 2008 that if you invest and you save these banks, and you save these giant companies and you bail them out, it will be good for you. They were told that, you know, we'll get your money back. Like, it'll save the economy. Well, saved those big companies, but they never got that money back. They never got the return on their investment. And it just happened again. And now everyone is worried about whether or not they're going to be able to have a home, whether or not they're going to be able to afford their rent. Like, that's what they care about is whether or not they're going to be on the street. And they don't think either party cares whether or not they live or die. They don't think that the Democrats care. They don't think that the Republicans care because they're not being taken care of. They get lip service. They get told to, that their taxes are, should be paid, but they never get that back. And the money that is taken from them, it doesn't come back into their community. It doesn't stay here. It goes to New York or it goes to New Jersey or it goes to, a, to another country. It's like you have giant companies that come and wipe out the small towns around here. That money doesn't stay here. Hmm. It goes somewhere else. Hmm. And so that is their biggest focus is whether or not their community, their way of life is actually going to be able to survive. And right now it's not. So I wanted to pick out three aspects of your program and your vision and your plan and what you've talked to about voters. And I want to touch on each one. And I want you to re relate each one to, in fact, the point we just made, which is how it resonates in a relatively Republican district, at least traditional. So the first one, which I really loved was, and I'm going to quote from it, we believe that the internet is now as vital to live in society as electricity, water, and energy. Essentially, you're arguing in your proposal to make it a public utility, make it, I think, accessible to everybody, essentially publicly owned networks. And one of the things I wanted to point out and then let you riff on this is that one of the reasons we have huge cable bills and the media companies have dominated now the landscape is not because of Republicans, it's because of Democrats. It's especially because of Bill Clinton, who pushed through the deregulation of the telecommunications industry, partly being pushed by the corporate donors, the media donors. And that really is the legacy that we are now living with today, with basically consolidation of media and high cable bills. So riff on that, and particularly about whether you think that resonates among people in your district. Yeah, I mean, 
the Clinton administration didn't just do that. They got rid of glass steeple. Mm. They allowed the financial collapse to happen. They set it in motion. And so people understand that. I mean, you talk to them about the investment banks, you talk to them about the housing market, you talk about the internet. What they understand is that we don't have a free market yet. It is a monopoly. You don't have, you basically have price fixing, you have monopolies in, in the internet, um, in the utility industry at this moment for broadband. And right now, what we've seen with the pandemic is we've just seen the issues that we had before exasperated to a point where we can't ignore them anymore. We have the fact that school had to go online, but like 30% of people don't have internet because they don't have a accessible or affordable internet to their homes. Small businesses, they can't survive now in this day and age without the internet, without being able to have access to it, without having broadband. But at the same time, especially in our rural areas, they don't have it. And so what we have to do is, it's very similar to the post office. We have to make sure that it is available to everyone, especially the rural areas, because the biggest economic boom that they can get is the ability to actually build small businesses. But you can't compete nowadays without the internet. You okay. literally cannot live or build or do anything. You can't apply for a job. You cannot do almost anything in our society without the internet. And so what we have done is we have allowed giant companies. And this is the thing that, I, that with Republicans and independents and the people that I grew up with, they understand and they love is the fact that we are not afraid to actually go against monopolies. We are not afraid to actually go against middlemen and scammers who are making our lives more expensive. For no reason whatsoever just because they can and so comcast is like the most hated company in the entire country like all of our like all of these companies are the most hated in our country so you're never going to lose a vote by saying you hate them well i think so, I, I would say that they yeah. could they probably compete with the insurance industries and some other industries yeah. as the most hated but i will agree with you that people hate their cable companies because of monopolies which unfortunately there is no antitrust real effort in this country, even on the part of Democrats as well, because they've been bought off by lobbyists. Maybe that'll change, especially if Elizabeth Warren has some leverage in 2021, because she's been very much against the monopolies, as has Bernie Sanders. I want to move to a second area that you point out and speak about, which is the Green New Deal, which I think many of my folks who are part of our audience are very big advocates of the Green New Deal and have very big opinions about the Green New Deal, all positive. But I want to quote from one specific line from your platform. The Green New Deal will make sure that everyone is able to get a decent paying job similar to what our grandparents grew up with. Now, our grandparents and maybe even their great great grandparents or certainly grandparents who lived in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the reason they had good jobs and good paying jobs was, were unions. Unions are what made the middle class. That's an issue in Florida because unions don't have the same leverage and ability to organize, say, in California or New York. How do you talk about unions in your district? And do you understand and do you support the notion that without strong unions, you can't have middle class jobs? I mean, at the end of the day, it's about political power and it's about who we're actually going to organize with. Right. At the end of the day, unions are the thing that actually prevents businesses and giant corporations from taking advantage of people. The organizing power is what does that. And so, yeah, we have to build those. We also have to do something very similar to like the Tennessee Valley Authority down here, where we actually have a federal job guarantee. And so when we talk about the Green New Deal, it's all specific to jobs. It's specific to not just because you can have a job. It doesn't mean it's a job worth doing. We call people essential, but we pay them like they're expendable. And so at the end of the day, it's a question of, is that job worth having? Because we can bring jobs. Walmart's done that for years, which all it did was destroy those family-owned businesses and get rid of the good paying jobs and replace them with a job that paid a third. And so when we talk about, we really tie, again, the anti-monopoly, anti-giant corporation destroying our towns uh, into that. And so, yeah, that's really what we focus on with the Green New Deal is Obviously, it's about the environment. Obviously, it is about creating sustainability. But on top of that, people are more worried about whether or not they can actually survive. Them. And so when we do it, especially in the red areas, we focus on the jobs. We focus on the fact that normal people have to have that organizing power. They have to be protected. Because right now, Florida has a right to work. Basically, it's written into the Constitution. State employees are not allowed to strike. Like They're not allowed to do that. And so when we talk about these things, we talk about getting rid of 
that. We talk about meaningful things to actually increase your power, bargaining. Medicare for all would do that as well because now they don't have to bargain for healthcare. If they have Medicare for all, that means that they now can barter or bargain for better wages. They can actually do those things and they have more political power. So yeah, basically everything that we do is focused on people mm-hmm. and building up the middle class and unions is a huge way to do that. And so again, explicitly, now that you're past the primary when you were talking essentially to Democratic voters and you have to broaden your message to a general population and you're running against, it's an open seat, you're running against a a woman who was nominated in the Republican primary, I believe. Do you think that emphasizing unions and talking to, you know, independents and you're going to have to bring over some Republicans or hope that they maybe stay home, but have a large turnout of Democrats, a large turnout of independents, does saying you have the right to be in a union work in that district? Depends on where you're at. Um, our district is very large geographically. And so messaging that works in like Clay County is not going to work in Putnam County. Messaging that works in Alachua County, which is very blue, is not going to work in Marion County. So we have picked and choose where we use certain framing and, and how we actually approach it. We never water down policy, but what we do is we actually frame it for the people that we are talking to in a way that they can understand in a way that's actually going to reach them. And so mm-hmm. for instance, with the Green New Deal, in Alachua County, which is very blue, that's University of uh, Florida, Gainesville area. We talk about the environment. Green New Deal, we focus on the environmental side because that's what people care about. When it comes to Putnam County, we focus on the jobs guarantee. We focus on being able to get good paying jobs. When we are talking just outside of Alachua, we're focusing on the unions. So it really depends on geographically where it is and what that town, honestly, what that community is focused on and what their biggest concerns are. The other part that I wanted to raise from your platform, you've adopted the Andrew Yang mantra about universal basic income. And up front, I want to tell you that I'm quite skeptical about UBI, mainly because I think it indirectly undercuts potentially Social Security, Medicare, and union organizing because the message somewhat, and Yang is, I think, not a good messenger on this, he doesn't stay up front we need union power. We need to have people organized in unions. We have to have huge union density. And on top of that, you get this UBI. And so my fear, and I'm curious about your perspective on this, my fear is that you get $1,000 a month, which is what Yang was proposing, I believe. But then that gives the ability of people who hate government to undermine all the other pieces of government and union organizing by saying, hey, you got that 1000 bucks. Be quiet. You should be happy with that. No, it's it's on top of the way I kind of think about this and the way I approach it is, you know, we've had we've had trickle down economics for like 40 years now. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows what that is. Everybody knows what it is. And we've basically what we've said is we're going to give money to the top and eventually, hopefully, maybe it'll get down to everybody else. The way I respond is, no, you started you started the base. You started the fundamentals like that's how you build a business. That's how you build a team. You make sure that the fundamentals are taken care of, have a solid foundation and you can build up and it actually builds something that is sustainable. So for instance, UBI, what it is able to do, at least the way I see it is, it is able to build that solid foundation where people no longer have to worry about whether or not they're going to be able to afford rent, be able to afford food. Those things are taken care of, which allows everyone to be able to actually do what they would like to do. You throw in Medicare for all on top of that, you throw um, in universal childcare, and that's almost $18,000 if you're no longer spending for private companies for the basics. And so now not only do you have your basics covered, but now you actually have enough money to be able to go do what you want. If you want to start a small business, if you want to start a company, actually take your life back, you can do that. You have the money and you have the security. And so at the end of the day, I think that's what it's about is, you know, you're working and we're expecting, like people are expected to work and nobody's saying you shouldn't be working your suit up. You're working, but right now people who are working still can't afford the basics. 15% of the people who are chronically almost have a full-time job. Somebody explain that to me. And so that is what we focus on, especially with UBI. I, I consider it to be trickle up economics. And my kind of the way I look at it is how about we start giving money to the base and tell the billionaires that eventually it might get up to them. Mm-hmm. And after 40 years, you know, if it doesn't work, then we'll change tactics and we'll re- reevaluate it then. But until we actually try the exact opposite of what's clearly not worked, then how are we ever going to know? <laughs> mm-hmm. 
and when I was somewhat critical of Andrew Yang about this, I want to be clear that one thing I, I liked about Yang when he was running was he clearly has a brain and he's thinking about things. I don't agree with the number of things he proposes in the particulars, but it's nice to see somebody that has a brain and is thinking about things and is not just regurgitating talking points that he's given by political consultants. Anyway, Adam, I want to wish you luck in your general election. And uh, when you're elected to Congress, we'll have you back on the show to talk about what life is like in Congress. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Good luck. If you got any questions or anything else for me, you just let me know. That'll do it for this week's broadcast. Thanks to my guests, Alexander Gallimberti and Adam Christensen. Our editor, as usual, is David Hebden. Our major sponsor is the American Postal Workers Union. Please do go over and subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Working Life Show with Jonathan Tassini. Please also become a sponsor of the show. You can do that in two ways, either by going over to our website at workinglife.org, looking for the podcast tab, and clicking your way over to Patreon where you can sign up either for a one-time donation or a monthly contribution, or you can go over to Act Blue. We partnered up with Act Blue, and there too, you can either make a one-time contribution or you can become a regular sponsor of the show, which of course we would certainly appreciate. Thanks for tuning in. Look forward to having you back next week.